Okay, so the one time in history that uh, God came and gave us his business card was at the time he gave us the Torah. He left his, leaves his business card, doesn't put his uh, email address or website, uh, but he does describe something about himself. And it's amazing what he chooses to define himself as. What Hashem chooses to define himself. I mean, what, what is Hashem for you? When you think of Hashem, you think of God, who is God for you? Me? A Jew, naturally, says God's everything. What else is there besides Hashem? God is everything. But when God came and revealed himself at the giving of the Torah, God showed himself and he revealed himself to the Jewish people, how does he describe himself? What does he say? God says, I am the Lord your God, who did what? Took you out of Egypt. Took you out of Egypt. Now, is that the number one thing he puts in his resume? That's the number one thing that he accomplished in, since he made the world? Speaking of creation of the world, wouldn't that be a much more important thing to mention? If he wants to say who he is, I mean, imagine a child who who gets in a fight with some other kids in a, a, and uh, he starts rebelling. No, she's doing good, she's doing good, she's doing, she's doing good, she's doing good, she's doing good, she's doing good. Beryl, Beryl, we, we have a very democratic way of solving this. We do in our show is we have arm wrestling matches. Yeah. Arm wrestling match. Yeah. So, so whoever wins gets to, gets to uh, gets to, gets to uh, decide who's gonna speak. All right. So so what happens like this. The um, this child is very rebellious. He doesn't listen to anything his parents have to say, and his father wants to tell his child why he should listen. So what does the father say to the child? You know why you should listen to me? You shouldn't listen to me because remember that one time you got in a fight with some other kids. Well, I rescued you. I saved you from that fight. Now, a father and child aren't, don't just have one encounter. They have hundreds and thousands of encounters. Millions of encounters. And the father is so much for a child. The father changes his child's diapers. Imagine a father saying to the child, you know why you should listen to me? Because I once rescued you when you got into a fight. And yet that's what God does. God tells the Jewish people, you know who I am? I am the Lord your God who took you out of Egypt. There's much more that he did. It was, this was a discussion 800 years ago between two giants of spirits, Yehuda Levi and then Evan Ezra. Yehuda Levi and Evan Ezra had a discussion. They were together for a long period of time, for Dova, and Yehuda Levi asked Evan Ezra this question. He says, how come when God announces who he is, he says, I am Lord your God, took you out of Egypt, why doesn't he say, I am Hashem who made the whole world. I made everything. Not just I took you out of, out of Egypt. I, I, I made everything. And it would seem that that's a lot more important. It's not just he did one miracle. He did so many miracles. As we just say in our prayers on Shabbos, and Nishmas, all the goodness and wonders and miracles God does for us. So how come, when a God is describing himself, he says, I am Lord your God who took you out of Egypt. Why is that so significant? Why is that so central? Are you saying that the miracle of creation of the world is even greater than trying to yesh me I didn't say the answer yet. So that's, no, no, that's the question. Okay. Yeah, the question is, it seems the creation is, is not just a bigger miracle, because it's, yesh me I. it's something out of nothing, not just a bigger miracle, but it's all-encompassing. Not just it's a greater, greater feat. Mm. It's everything. Every, he, he made everything. There is nothing other than what he made. But nobody witnessed it in the world. But people do witness it going down its right. No? Okay, that's, that's a possible answer. That's, a, that's an interesting answer. I want to share another answer. Uh, one, an answer which I think is, is something that we could all... Uh, well, each of us will find very meaningful uh, in regards to whatever's going on in life. Whatever's going on. Whether like a Jew like Menachem Akivi over here, like Mendy who just Baruch Hashem started to put on film today, out of uh, one level of limitations. Yeah, it's true. Mm -hmm. Amos. Or like Yisrael Levin, who's leaving uh, Cheder Menachem on Sunday, he's going to be free from school for a couple of weeks. Right? Whatever, whatever is going on, whatever, whatever is happening in your life, it's, it's, I'm going to show something which, which is really, really powerful and meaningful. And it's really, it's, 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 uh, 
it's, it's something that we could, uh, it's a good one, something we could live with. But we, this idea of leading Mitzrayim is a central thing. The Sefer HaChinuch says, you shouldn't wonder about why leaving Egypt, excess of Egypt is so important. Every mitzvah we do, every mitzvah, many mitzvahs we do, we mention departure from Egypt. By Kiddush, every Shabbos, every holiday, we say the, to commemorate the departure from Egypt. There are many mitzvot, that, like Tefillin, Tefillin it says specifically the Torah to commemorate leaving Egypt. Pidin Aben, the redemption of the firstborn. And the question is, why is it so important? So before we get to the answer, let's understand something about the unique nature of this upcoming holiday of Pesach. Mitzvah Shem, uh, next week won't have a class. Everyone will be busy uh, cleaning for Pesach, cleaning for searching for chametz. Uh, but before we get into uh, p- p- uh, get, get under the refrigerators and start time to clean, l- l- let's think about something. So there's a difference between the holiday of Pesach and all other holidays. All other holidays are commemoration for something. Shem did a miracle for us when. Uh, we just celebrated the holiday of Purim. We remember the miracles that God did for us when He took us out of, out of when He saved us from Hama. It's all about remembering things that happened. Every holiday rem- we, we commemorate something. What's unique about Pesach is that we're not commemorating anything. The Torah doesn't say you should remember just that you left Egypt. The Torah says much more than that. The Torah says you're supposed to feel that you yourself left Egypt. Not that you're commemorating how they left Egypt, how your forefathers left Egypt. You're supposed to look at yourself as if you yourself left Egypt. It's a whole different thing. It's not about remembering, it's about experiencing. There's even a custom, I don't know anybody does this custom, but it's a really cool custom. By other holidays, you're also supposed to experience every year, it comes around the same thing. You're, the you're, same type of experience, the same type of revel- revelation of God. There's only one holiday where we, the Torah says you're obligated to look at yourself as if you left Egypt. Doesn't say you're obligated to look at yourself as if you experienced the holiday of Hanukkah. Doesn't say you're obligated to look at yourself as if you experienced the holiday of Purim. The only holiday that says you have to look at yourself and feel that you yourself left Egypt is by. Talk, but every, the Rebbe says on every holiday is like that. There, there is an element of Pesach and every, Pesach and every holiday, but. Not, the, no, the, not, but every holiday it says that that day when it comes, it, that gives a new opening of power for that time to every holiday. We're, we're, we're going to discuss that with a little later about how there's a concept of leaving the time every day, but. The only holiday that says you have to relive as if you left uh, left Egypt is uh, this holiday. Other holidays. The Bashem to say about Purim did not get him as you. Oh 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 oh! oh. This is a good kasha. Baal Shem Tov said very good that if you read the story of Purim as if it happened a long time ago, then it's not it's not it's not uh, you have to fill your obligation. Very good. But Montoya says it has to be new today. Like Montoya says it has to be new, new today. To relive the experience. And I don't know. So, the divine. Uh, let's, 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 let's think about this for a second. The Torah does say that space and time are connected, and just like a space that was once holy always is holy, so too is it with time. That a time which is once holy, every year there's a revelation that happens again at that time. There's, there's a revelation. So, the same revelation that happened when God brought the miracle of Purim it happens again every year. And Baal Shanta said, you can't look at it as just something that happened a long time ago. You have, to, you have to realize that the revelation is happening now. No, and it's higher than last year. And Mylon Baal there, there's, there's an additional Stronger element. Yeah. But the, the, to have such a strong obligation that, that you have to relive the experience of leaving Egypt, that language isn't used by even Baal Shanta, who says, if you read the Megillah as if it's a story that happened a long time ago, you have a obligation doesn't actually say you have to experience the story of Purim and feel that you are you were you were about to be killed and now you were saved. There is a similar revelation, but not that we don't find this whole concept of like enduring the tragedy and 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 coming out of the tragedy. Perhaps at other holidays there's an emphasis on 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 remembering the revelation of the time. But here by the story of, of Pesach, the Torah says, look at yourself, not just at the at, at not just look at the revelation, not just at the at the happy ending. Here the Torah says let's look through the entire story to feel the bitterness, to feel the pain. You have to look at you as if you left Egypt. There is um there is a um a unique obligation here. And the question is, what does it even mean? 
how do we get into Egypt? How are we going out of Egypt? What does it mean? So the cool custom, which I wanted to mention before, some people, they have this custom, they put the mats on their shoulders, and they put in a little bag, and they walk around, like, like to actually, like, demonstrate we're leaving Egypt. So, okay, we could do that, but what does it really mean? How are we leaving Egypt? So before we, we get there, we start the Seder, we say these words. This is the bread of affliction that our forefathers ate in Egypt. What do we say next? You look at a little, a little bit of a negative statement over there. This is the bread of affliction. We're talking about leaving Egypt, Mitzrayim, miracles, wonders, and we start off with this negative statement. This is the bread of affliction that our forefathers ate in Egypt. Okay, what do we say next? All those who are hungry, let them come and eat. All those who are hungry should celebrate the holiday of Pesach with us. Now we talk about the present. First we talk about the past. This is the rhetoric of affliction that our forefathers did then. Then we talk about the present, anyone who's hungry coming in. Then we talk about the future, next year in Jerusalem, next year will be free. Okay. So these, this announcement we're making doesn't seem to fit in with the whole Haggadah. This is, the Haggadah hasn't even really started yet, and we're making this declaration. It would seem that this declaration would fit in when we talk about the matzah, later on in the Agadar, we quote Rabbi Gamliel, who says that you don't fulfill your obligation of the same unless you mention Pesach, Matzah, murder. So then over there, we should talk about that. And second of all, what are we saying about the matzah? This is the matzah that our forefathers ate in Egypt. They didn't eat in Egypt. They ate the matzah when they left Egypt. They ate them. They, they baked the dough. There was no time for dough to rise. So they baked the dough, and they ate the matzah and, as they departed from Egypt. But not in Egypt. Why do we say we, this is the bread of affliction that our forefathers ate in Egypt? This is the this is the matzah. This is the, commemorates the miracle. Because it costs so much money. Right, right, right. Never mind. So, so the question is, why are we being so negative over here? It seems so sad. It seems like a Tishabah kind of thing to say. This is the bread of affliction that our forefathers ate in Egypt. It's not it's not Tishabah. What, what's going on? Second of all, why are you inviting people to eat now? Anyone who's hungry, come and eat. <coughs> What are you talking about? If you want, you're, you're in your house, everything, the doors are closed, the windows are shut. Anybody who's hungry, come and eat. Who's going to hear you? Why, why making this? You should have made this announcement in shul. If you wanted people who are hungry to come and eat, make an announcement in shul. Anybody who's hungry, can, oh, we'll find you. People who want to come. But why are you making this announcement when you, when you get, we get, get home? So, the Avudraham, he says, Avudraham. The Avudraham says like this, that uh, they ate matzah when they were in Egypt too, because the Egyptians wanted the Jewish people to have food that would allow them to work for long hours, and matzah is a food that that slaves and would eat because it's something that that that, that is uh, it's not just as cheaper, but it's something which is uh, filling and it's and it's uh, something that would allow the the slaves in Egypt to work harder. And uh, with less. But um, the obvious question is, is that we're not talking about being in Egypt. We're talking about leaving Egypt. This is not just a matzah that we ate then. This is a matzah we eat when we departed from Egypt. Why are you mentioning this now? The Barbanel says um, that, we, we, sorry, the Vujraham says that we want the poor people who are coming to our Seder, not even could afford to make a Seder, they're coming to your Seder, and they may feel uncomfortable. They're coming to your Seder, they're guests. They can't make their own Seder. So you make an announcement, listen, not every, we all were in Egypt. We all were in Egypt, this is the matzah. We all were poor, we all needed Hashem's help. So there, that, that, that's why you mentioned this, says the Jaham. But um, we're still left with a question, because just historically, this is not the matzah that they left, that they ate when they were in Egypt. This is, a mat, this is We eat matzah because we departed from Egypt. The matzah is a food of freedom. Why are we calling it the food of slavery? There's a Jew, his name is Gimpel Oremland. I know what, sto- what year the story took place, uh, but he was by the Rebbe for Shabbos Bereshis. Shabbos Bereshis, a custom is to sell the mitzvahs of the year. And uh, he was uh, thinking about, he wanted to contribute to the shul. He wasn't such a, wasn't so familiar with the, with the scene over there. And um, I'm not sure exactly what year the story took place, but, but he, at his, even though he was not so, he wasn't so poor, but he, uh, uh, at that time, there was a large, large amount of money. I'll give $1,000 to the shul. The Rebbe looked at him, and the Rebbe said 5000 So 5000 was way, way, way beyond what he was able to do. But, uh, and the Rebbe looked at him, the Rebbe saw that something's 
bothering him. This is not the number he wants to give. The Rebbe said, this year you'll make double and, and double and more. <coughs> okay, that sounds great. That sounds wonderful. Double and more, fantastic. The whole year goes by and there's no double and more, nothing. He, he, he was living in Miami at the time and he had a um, senior citizen's um, old age home and uh, the day before Rosh Hashanah, the doctors who were, who, were, uh, who were taking care of the old age home, they came to him with an, with an offer to buy the old age home. And he didn't want to. He invested so much and he was interested just, you know, just having this business and, and being supported by it. So just, but he didn't want to also like, like you know, like throw them off, it just just uh, say I'm not interested, because, you know, so he threw out this crazy astronomical figure that they would for sure would reject, because why in the world would they, would they want to accept such a crazy number? But they said, okay, great, we'll take it. And uh, ju- just as a first deposit towards this purchase, they gave him $15,000, not right, day before Rosh Hashanah. Double and more over the five thousand that he uh, he given the year before, so that year you can be sure he went to the Rebbe again for Shabbos Brachos, <laughs> and uh, he was actually with another Jew from Los Angeles, all of us my Beryl Weiss, trying. They were they were discussing uh, buying a certain mitzvah, to uh, and and Beryl Weiss uh, won the won the uh, bid, and the, he ended up not buying the first pasuk, bought the second pasuk, and the second pasuk, and the second, I'm sorry, simple step, yeah, he bought the second pasuk, and the second pasuk, he said, I will, I'll, I'm paying whatever the Rebbe says. Whatever the Rebbe says, that's what I'm going to buy. So he, he goes in the Rebbe's room for a private audience after the holiday, and he asks the Rebbe, you know, what should I do? The Rebbe said, 126. 126. He was expecting, like, you know, like, like let's look Double and triple of last year it was was fifteen thousand to five thousand maybe this year will be a hundred thousand make so much more and he's like why the Rebbe said I don't need the money it's not, it's not the money that I need what I wanted was I wanted you to go beyond your limitations so I wanted you to I wanted you to go beyond where you were and to go beyond your limitations now you've seen what's basically I don't know the words ever used but now that you've seen already how this works whatever you give it's not going to be beyond your limitations it's already like that's already makes sense. So it doesn't matter what you give now. But then, last year, was something you know, that you didn't, you didn't know how it was going to work, and I, want you, I wanted to take you out of your limitations. The Torah tells us to, to do avoid as Hashem, to serve Hashem. What does serving Hashem mean? To serve. Service means to go, to work hard, to go beyond your limits. To go not just do what, what, what's regular, what's normal. Avoid as Hashem means with an effort, to make an effort beyond your limitations. So, When Hashem is telling us, when He's announcing, describing Himself, I'm Lord your God who took you out of Egypt, versus I'm Lord your God who created heaven and earth, God is saying to you like this, I made a world, I know the world that I made, but I want you to make a world. The world that I made, I made. I made the world out of nothing. But I want to talk to you about the world that you're going to build for me. And the way you're going to build the world for me is by (coughs) going beyond the limits of the creation that I made. Hashem made the world with certain with nature, with limits, with the parameters. Everything in existence has its nature and limits, including, including the human being. So Hashem is telling, telling the Jewish people, I am what your God took you out of Egypt. He's saying the goal of giving us the Torah, and the goal of the Jewish people being sent into this world, the mission of a Jew is, is to take the world that Hashem made and to go beyond its limits. That's, that's the goal. And the reason why this is possible is because God took us out of Egypt. Once God took us, took us out of Egypt, there is no limitations anymore. It wasn't that God has broke one limitation. When God took us out of Egypt, all any limitation that any Jew will have in history, he is imaginary. There are no limitations anymore. Once God took us out of Egypt, there's nothing that's impossible for a Jew. As Maharami Prague says, well, we left Egypt, what about the subsequent exiles? So why are we celebrating going out of Egypt? And he said, once Hashem took us out of Egypt, there's no such thing as a Jew being in prison anymore. It's, it's similar to what the previous Rabbi Shereba said when he was, when he was um, released from prison and sent into exile in Kastrama. So on the train um, platform, he made the, fo- very fo- he made the following uh, declaration. He said, not with our will did we go into exile, not with our will did we go out of exile, but this all nations of the world shall know. They should all know that only our bodies were sent into exile, not our souls. 
In regards to Torah and its mitzvahs, no one has any say over us. No one can stop us from what we need to do. Why is it? Why the reason? You know what's going on. Any limitation the Jew feels that limits and prevents him doing what he needs to do is imaginary. Hashem took us out of Mitzrayim. You know, people when they're younger, they like to invest. They want to grow their business. They want to. They, they, they want to build. People who are older generally. They don't. They don't like doing that so much. They want to be as satisfied with what they have arrived in life. They just want. Okay, well, I made it, and then they're not so quick to 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 to, um, to invest. The previous Rebbe, he became a businessman before he became a Rebbe, and he asked his father for a bracha. His father gave him an interesting bracha. His father's bracha was: You shouldn't have Baal Bata Shanachas. What's Baal Bata Shanachas? You shouldn't have the perspective of a businessman. What does that mean? He says p- businessmen generally feel Balbatim generally feel that change is insane. The way things are, let's let stay that way. Normal is okay. I mean, boring is is good. Whatever change is insane. But the truth is that when, when Hashem tells us the Gwadim Mitzrayim, as you mentioned before, it's not just then night of the Seder, but every day there's a concept of leaving Mitzrayim. If if you're here for another day, that means there's something more you have to do beyond what you did yesterday. The famous story the Gemara says about Rabbi Yechman Zakai. Yechman Zakai was one of the only uh, people who were given the title <coughs> Rabban, Yechman Zakai. Usually the title Rabban was only given to the royal family, those sages who come from the tribe of Yehuda. But Yechman Zakai, who's unique, not a mayor, it's called Reb Meir, Rabbi, Rabbi Akiva, called Rabbi, Rabbi Akiva, but Rabbi, Rabban Yechman Zakai. Yechman Zakai, before he passes away, what does he say? I don't know what direction I'm going to go in. I don't know if I'm going to get Hanim. We're going to go to I don't know if we're going to go to hell or to heaven. How could he not know which way he's going to go? I mean, who else was heaven made for if not for him? The test is about Rabbi Yechimah Zakkai. He never said any words that were, that, that were not valuable. He never, not just he was good for God, but there's no one ever said hello to him sec, uh, first. He always greeted people before, before anybody else. He was judged both, both between man and man, between man and God. He was perfect. And yet he says, I don't know which way I'm going. Why didn't he, why didn't he know which way he was going? The answer is, is that he was afraid that all that he did in his life was all natural, all the way he was. But he, he did all these wonderful things. But maybe he did all those wonderful things because this is this is just his nature, or like like the story in Gemara of Yisim and Kisman and Chimen Tradian. Chimen Tradian was teaching Torah under the Roman Empire, and he was sentenced to be killed. And he visited his teacher, uh, and his teacher said he asked his teacher, "Will I merit to go to the world to come?" What did he respond to him? He's about to be killed. The, 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 the Gemara says the gory details of how he was killed, how they put uh, wool on him so they shouldn't die right away, and he should be tortured as he's being burnt alive. And so he asks his teacher, well, I go to the world to come. His teacher says, well, did you do anything special? <laughs> what are you doing special? The guy's teaching Torah in public is being killed, uh, burnt alive. Did you do anything special? He says, yeah. What did you do special? He said, one time I collected money. He didn't just teach Torah in public. He also helped people. He collected money. Collecting money to help people. And my money got mixed up with the communal money. And what would happen if he went to a rabbi? His money got mixed up with the communal money? Probably halachically. Oh, so what he did was he gave it all to charity. He says, oh, he said, that's what you did? Then may my portion have to be with your portion. I wish I could be with you. Why? What's so special? So the Alter Rebbe writes that it's a nature of people which are more studious to be a little more reserved, a little conservative. So he, if the fact that he went out of his nature to, when, it, when he needed to, that showed that the, all the Torah study that he did wasn't just because it was his nature to study Torah. It wasn't because he was just a studious kind of person, but because he was dedicated to serve Hashem beyond nature. That's the meaning of, of uh, Helach Ma'anya. When we read in the beginning of the, of the Seder, this is the bread of affliction that our forefathers ate in Egypt. What are we trying to say? What are we celebrating Pesach for? We're going to read in the, a few lines later in the Haggadah how there are every, in a generation there are those who try to kill us. And, we're reading, and we're going to, there are people which are hungry. That's what we're inviting them to eat to the Seder. There's still poverty. So we left Mitzrayim, fine, but we still have people who want to kill us. And we, there's still people which are hungry. So what are we celebrating? So what we're celebrating is, is that when Hashem took us out of Mitzrayim, for all, Hashem gave each of us the ability to go beyond whatever limitation we have to do what Hashem wants us to do. There's no such thing as Jew having limitation. No such thing as, as you can't get out of where you need to be. No such thing as, no such thing as not arriving where you need to be. During the um, Holocaust, the Blue Rebbe, Rabbi Yeshua Shapiro, he was in Bergen-Belsen. 
in Tavshin in 1944, in the worst times in the Holocaust. And he managed to bribe a Nazi guard, and they give the Nazi guard money to allow them to bake matzah for Pesach. Okay? He's very excited. They got some stones, and they built a little stone oven, and and uh, they built it. They were going to bake matzahs. And he was so excited. Imagine, I mean, he, he didn't have any special kapata, a special Shabbos clothing to wear, but imagine how, how, how he felt baking matzahs in the middle of the Nazi hell. And he's baking the matzahs. And as he's baking the matzahs, the guard that he bribed comes in drunk. And he beats him, and he beats him, breaks his bones, and he breaks the oven, and there's nothing left. And everyone ran away. So, no, there's no matzahs. They had a seder. The Blush of Rebbe repeated whatever he remembers from the Haggadah. And he gets up to matzah. He gets up to matzah, there is, he doesn't have any matzah, but he has actually a little piece of matzah. The one piece, it wasn't a kazayas, it wasn't the right amount of matzah, it was a little tiny piece of matzah. Little tiny piece of matzah. So he says, okay, who wants to eat the matzah? So everyone's like, you should eat the matzah. You're the one who sacrificed yourself for the matzah. You should eat the matzah. So there's one lady there, a widow, her husband had been killed by Nazis. And she says, actually, I don't think you should eat the matzah. I, I have a, my son is also here in the concentration camp, and he he is a young boy, and he, he should eat the matzah. He should eat the matzah. He's, 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 he's the next generation. He should eat the matzah. And they gave him the matzah. The war is over. The Blue Javarada eventually uh, leaves there, and this lady, this Almonis widow, Kushitsky, uh, she is offered a shidduch, to, and she offered an, uh, someone to meet someone. Who does she, so, yeah, I have someone really wonderful for you. Who does she, uh, Who wants to meet her? The Blue Javarada. The Blue wants to meet her. Why would you want to meet her? She says, well, what, oh, Rebbe, why would you be interested in me? He said, if in the middle of the Nazi hell, you're thinking about a child who's going to grow up, and he's going to eat the matzahs, and he's going to have children eat the matzahs, he's going to in the middle of everything, this is something special. This is, this is what a Yid is about. This is what a Jew is about. A Jew is about that there's not, not just the way things look, the way things seem to be, but the, that a Yid is given the ability, no matter what's going on, to go beyond whatever is their nature is, and to do what Hashem, to do the mission of Hashem. And that's why the opening sentence of that God, that what do we say? It's true, the bread of, there's a bread of affliction, and there's two, the true that there's poor people, etc. But Hashem gave us, when He took us out of Mitzrayim, the ability to get to Mashiach. Hashem gave us the ability, each of us, to have our personal redemption. And it means practically. It means for Ezra, it means one thing. For me, it means something else. For Ari, it means something else. What it means is that we have to go beyond our limitations. We weren't born just to be and to be the way we are today, the way we were yesterday. Leaving Mitzrayim means Hashem gave us the Torah, what does Hashem say who he is? I'm Lord your God who took you out of Egypt. I may have an earth, but why did I put you here? I, want, I put you here because I want you to go beyond your limits and to, to uh, challenge the status quo and to uh, have a personal redemption and get to do your mission and bring the coming of Mashiach. Amen.